Hi, everyone. I just want to welcome you as you get logged in. My name is Susan Muller, and Mike Alton will be joining us shortly to talk about social media myths, myths that we need to know are not true. So I, while everyone's logging on, I wanted to give you just a little bit of information about today's session. We're planning for about an hour total with uh, presentation first and then questions at the end of the session. So if you do have a question, please feel free to just enter it into the chat box. I'll keep an eye on those uh, during Mike's presentation and then I will uh, circle back to them at the end and invite Mike to answer those questions. There will be a recording provided after the session. It usually takes us about a day to get that out. So you can expect to get that recording in about a day. Um, I think those are the main questions that people tend to have. Um, and it is the top of the hour. So let me say hello. My name is Susan Muller, and I am the Senior Marketing Manager here at BuzzSumo. BuzzSumo provides data insights to help you understand your audience better so you can give them the content that they want to consume. And I am so excited to be here with Mike Alton. Mike has uh, been an inspiration to me in the content that he produces and how engaged he is with the world of content marketing and social media marketing. Mike is currently the brand evangelist for Agora Pulse, which is a social media management tool that I personally use at BuzzSumo and love it. And he's going to be talking with us today about 10 uh, stunning social media myths and helping us to see that they actually are myths and we can be free of worries about those things. In addition to his work at Agora Pulse, Mike is also the blogging brute. You can find him there. And we were just talking before the session started. Uh, he's been blogging for, I think, more than five years, seven years, and has probably written at least a thousand blog posts. And he's also been engaged on social media, both in a casual capacity and now in a professional capacity. So he is certainly qualified to talk to us about social media. So Welcome, Mike. I'm glad you're here and looking forward to learning from you. Thanks so much, Susan. It is an absolute pleasure. I can't wait to dive into, as you said, these, these myths. Uh, some of these are, uh, you could even go so far as to say they're urban legends. <laughs> um, and, and these are all things that our social media lab at Agora Pulse has kind of dug into. Uh, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about that. Uh, and, and as you said, you know, for those of you watching and listening, if you've got questions as I go through these, uh, you want to know more about a particular experiment or maybe something that, we've, that I'm talking about has sparked some other question that's maybe related, by all means, throw that in the comments and we will have plenty of time to address those as we go. So let's get into these 10 stunning social media myths that have been busted. So, in the 19th century, scientists, they began to formulate an established procedure for running experiments and for testing hypotheses. They wanted to create a way to distinguish the real work that they were doing with the pseudoscience practiced by charlatans and the ignorant. So they invented the scientific method. It's a standardized approach to experimentation that all scientists could follow and adhere to. This, in turn, allowed other scientists to recognize the validity of each other's tests and theories. Now, based on the work of Aristotle, the method involves making conjectures, that's hypotheses, deriving predictions from them as logical consequences, and then carrying out those experiments based on those predictions to determine whether the original conjecture was correct. So, what's the social media lab? Well, fast forward 200 years, and once again, we find ourselves beset upon all sides by so-called gurus and experts claiming they've found the secret to making millions online, and you can too for just four easy payments of $997. <laughs> Who are today's Aristotles? Who can we turn to today to find out what really works or doesn't on social media? Well, the social media lab, of course. Launched by Agora Pulse in 2017, the Social Media Lab scientists follow standard scientific method, but applied to today's 
marketing conundrums. They ask the questions that are plaguing business owners everywhere, then run experiments designed to get real data in real answers. Why is that necessary? Well, the fact is, most business owners just don't have the time to run these tests themselves. Yes, every business owner should test different approaches and techniques. Every brand needs to determine for themselves what topics and tactics resonate best with their audience. But who has time to come up with a way to share 30 posts to Instagram in a month to test how many hashtags really drive the most reach and engagement? Well, to put it bluntly, we do. So let me go over real quick how these tests are conducted. So every test starts with a question or an hypothesis. Often pulled from the headlines and the latest trending topics, these questions fly in the face of accepted standards of social media marketing. Once we have a test in mind, we map out what data we think we'll need in order to come to a statistically significant conclusion. This typically includes a determination of how many social posts to which platforms and what other variables may need to be controlled. The other benefit that the lab brings to these experiments is access to multiple profiles across multiple vertical industries using varying sizes of audiences. Now, once the format and content of each test is determined, posts are scheduled out and monitored, and at the conclusion of the test, the requisite data is collected, such as reach or engagement, and then it's analyzed to determine the outcome. But this brings up an important point about our tests, the results, and what we publish. We aren't always right. In fact, with some of these tests, the fact that we didn't bust the rumor is itself the shocking part. So what are the top 10 myths that the social media lab has busted? Now, those were the boring details of how we've reached some pretty stunning conclusions over the course of conducting dozens and dozens of experiments. I hope you're ready now to dive into some of the top tests. And I hope you're interested in learning what some of social media's most shocking myths are and what the reality is. Myth number one, negative Facebook ad comments should be left in place. Now, when businesses use Facebook ads to promote posts, one of the outcomes advertisers hope for is a lot of comments. Comments on an ad will increase the overall amount of engagement, they'll encourage others to participate in the conversation and bring more organic, aka free, visibility to the ad itself, which has led some advertisers to advise businesses that it's a good idea to leave negative comments in place. All publicity is good publicity, right? Well, that didn't sit too well with us, so we decided to test that. Our hypothesis? The sentiment of comments will affect people's tendency to click on your Facebook ads. In other words, we thought that negative comments would reduce click-through rates. We tested this by running two identical ads targeting website visitors from just the past three days one for positive comments, and one for negative. Now, to avoid overlap, we actually kept one ad running at a time, and we seeded the comments ourselves in order to control the environment. The results? The Facebook ad with positive comments had a 56% higher click-through rate than the ad with negative comments which means that ads with positive comments were more likely to get clicks than ads with negative comments. Therefore, it is critically important that businesses use a tool like Agorapulse, for instance, to make sure that they see every single Facebook ad comment and respond accordingly. Myth number two. Using a third-party publishing tool will kill your reach and engagement. For years, third-party tools like ours have been plagued with this notion that using a tool to schedule and publish content to social networks like Facebook is a bad idea. And despite the networks themselves stating that they do not penalize users for turning to tools for help, the rumors and claims persist. So let's test that. Our hypothesis, that posting with third-party tools 
has no negative impact on organic reach. In other words, uh, using a tool like, say, Buffer or Hootsuite or Agorapulse shouldn't hurt the reach of your posts. We tested this by using three well-established Facebook pages and three scheduling tools, Buffer, Hootsuite, and Agorapulse. We posted a mix of post types with a varying schedule over the course of the test period. And by the way, most of the experiments we run, they're conducted over at least four weeks so that we eliminate holidays and events and other variables that would impact a, a shorter test. Now, what did we find? That posting with these tools actually had a positive impact on reach. <laughs> I mean, we knew that use of tools shouldn't harm posts, but that result, that shocked even us. Myth number three. Posting the same content on Facebook will kill your reach and engagement. <laughs> Seeing a trend there? The idea of always sharing new and unique posts and information to social networks like Facebook in particular sounds great in theory. But how do you find the time to keep up with that machine? And what if you have lots of great articles in your archive that are still relevant today? Well, we call that content evergreen. And if we want that content to continue to work for us today, we have to find ways to keep using and sharing it. But won't that hurt our reach on Facebook? Won't our fans and the algorithm tire of the same posts over and over? Well, that's what we set out to test. Our hypothesis? That evergreen content will see a decrease in reach and engagement the more it is posted to Facebook. Now, we tested this over four weeks on my own Facebook page for the social media hat. There were no hashtags or mentions used on any post, and these were the only posts scheduled during this period. I actually shared three link posts a day for 28 days using just 12 different articles, which resulted in each article being repeated a whopping seven times within that month. So what happened? Well, while the final post for nearly every article got less reach than the first share did, interestingly, every post saw varying levels of reach and engagement throughout the test. We saw similar results in a different test on LinkedIn. And as you can see here with this particular article, it was actually the third share on a Wednesday that got the most reach of all the shares. So, while you likely shouldn't repeat the same content as often as I did, clearly, sharing the same content regularly can result in reaching and engaging more fans. Myth number four. Participating in Instagram pods will bring you more reach and engagement. Hmm. According to Jen Herman, an Instagram pod is a group of like-minded people on Instagram who connect via a group DM or Facebook group. And they proceed to like and comment on every single post <laughs> that the others in the pod share to Instagram. The proposed result is increased post engagement and genuine comments, and as a result, better rankings in the Instagram algorithm. So the idea is by getting this fabricated increased engagement, you can trick Instagram's algorithm and your posts will show up more in the feed of your followers. But does that actually work? Well, let's test it. Our hypothesis, the activity from Instagram pods will not result in an increase in impressions for posts not shared in the pods. In other words, what happens to our other posts? the non-pod people posts. <laughs> well, to test this, we posted to Instagram once a day for seven days, adding each post to two different pods that we became members of. And then we compared the engagement on those posts to our past seven posts and then the next seven posts. So what happened? Impressions went up 6.41% per post and engagement went down 4.41% per post. But 
the increase of 6.41% in impressions was actually due to an increase in followers during that period, making the increase not statistically relevant. Therefore, Instagram pods are a waste of time. There was no measurable long-term improvement in Instagram post performance. Myth number five, Instagram feed ads perform better than story ads. Now, Instagram stories are a relatively new feature, which means ads in a story format, which appear between each other's, you know, other users' stories, would seem to be less effective. Conventional wisdom would suggest that with fewer people viewing and using stories, putting ads within the normal Instagram feed would probably be the better way to go. What do you think? Should feed ads outperform story ads? Well, that's what we want to know. Our hypothesis, there's no difference whether you use Instagram feed ads or stories when you're driving traffic to a product that caters to all age groups. The premise here being that there may be a slight demographic difference between story and feed users. So we wanted to be sure to test something that didn't appeal more to one group or the other. So we tested by creating two similar ads for feed and story placement and compared the results after statistical significance was reached. And what were those results? <laughs> Instagram stories reached 44% more users and they had a 23% higher conversion rate than feed ads. I makes it quite clear that ads and Instagram stories are way more cost-effective at driving traffic to our site than Instagram feed ads. Our data supports it and even hints that traffic from stories is of a higher quality. So that's definitely a technique that you're going to want to test in your own ad campaigns. Now here's a fun one. Myth number six. It's better to put Instagram hashtags in the first comment. How many of you have done this? How many of you have heard that it's better to put your hashtags in that first comment? Let me know in the comments. <laughs> now, you may know or may not, the success or failure of an individual Instagram post is driven by the correct use of hashtags. So a lot of effort has been employed by users to find magical combinations of techniques and choices. And one such claim is that if you post a picture to Instagram and then immediately place your hashtags into the first comment instead of the original post itself, that post will get more reach. Well, that sounds kind of fishy to us. So we tested it. Our hypothesis? Instagram hashtags in the original post will have higher reach than hashtags in comments. How do we test it? Well, spanning three different accounts, 51 posts with hashtags in the comments were shared and 66 posts with hashtags in the original post were created. And what do we find? Posts with hashtags in the original post had a combined average reach of 66, while posts with hashtags in the comments had a combined average reach of 51, which means Instagram posts with hashtags in the original post outperformed posts with hashtags in the comments. Reach was nearly 30% higher. Let me say that again. We reached more people by including hashtags in the original post post. Hmm. Myth number seven, text only posts on LinkedIn will perform poorly. On LinkedIn, just like on Facebook or Twitter, users have the choice of sharing text posts, images, or links with link previews. We've seen from other experiments and trusted experts that on Facebook, text only posts don't work well at all. But on LinkedIn, our friend Melanie Dodaro of Top Dog Social Media, she says otherwise. Curious, we decided to test to see if she was right and we were wrong. Our hypothesis, text-only updates on LinkedIn will have the lowest amount of views. We tested this by posting 107 times across three accounts using text, link, and photo posts over the course of the experiment, including looking at posts on Melanie's account. And what do the results actually show? 
Comparing the combined averages of links and photos to the average of text posts, we see text had an increase of 1,069% views. It seems, based on this data, that text posts are preferred on LinkedIn over any other post type. Now note that video posts, and certainly not live video, weren't included in this test and likely perform better than any other kind of post. Perhaps that's something New will be able to test soon. LinkedIn, as you probably know, has rolled out live video. It's in beta, it's in a limited test, but hopefully soon we'll have access to it and we can test that as well. So, myth number eight. Long posts perform better, particularly on LinkedIn. So if text posts perform best, on LinkedIn. To me, the next logical question is, well, just how long should those posts be, right? Again, conventional wisdom here suggests that longer posts should do quite well on the professional network. But is that truly the case? Hmm. Let's find out. Our hypothesis? LinkedIn posts with longer character count will have a higher number of views. We tested this by scheduling 14 short posts and 14 long posts to three accounts spread out once daily over a two week period. The short posts were all 140 characters or less while the long posts had significantly higher character counts but varied in length. The results? Shockingly, short text posts on LinkedIn resulted in nearly 14% higher views per post compared to the long ones. Yeah, here's another example of when we proved ourselves wrong and discovered something truly interesting about how best to post to a social network. Apparently, short text posts to LinkedIn will perform best. Hmm. Myth number nine, short tweets within that original 140 character count perform best. Well, there's probably no shortage of opinion with regard to that change in tweet size from 140 to 280 characters. There was absolutely no data as to whether it was worthwhile to use that extra real estate. Should Twitter users continue to be as brief as possible, particularly considering we just saw how much more successful short posts on LinkedIn are? Hmm. Let's test that. Our hypothesis, tweeting with the maximum allowed 280 characters will not result in more engagement or impressions. So how do we test that? Well, we posted to five different Twitter accounts using a combination of nine tweets with 140 characters and nine tweets with 280 characters. Huh. And what do we find? Impressions of 280 character tweets were nearly 8% higher than 140 character tweets. Likes and clicks were also higher. Which means it's easy to see, based on this data, that 280 character count tweets perform better. But, scientifically speaking, the results weren't significant, unfortunately. So that's a test we'll soon revisit to get more statistically significant data. Now finally, myth number 10. Using emoji in tweets will result in higher impressions and engagement. This one's interesting because not only do I use emoji in almost all my tweets, this is something we actually studied previously. We looked at the use of emoji within Instagram posts and we found conclusively that it helped with engagement. So would the same be true for Twitter? Now, HubSpot and WordStream, two big brands, they both claim that that's so, but they had little scientific data to support those claims. So we decided to test for ourselves. Our hypothesis, using at least one emoji in a tweet will result in higher impressions and engagement. And the test, well, we gathered 100 tweets without emojis from our own Agorapulse Twitter account, and we measured the impressions and the engagement. We then posted 20 different tweets using one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then five emojis. So that's a total of 
100 tweets with one, two, three, four, and five emojis each. We did this to get a good average across 100 tweets with emoji. And then we could also report on which amount of emoji produced the best results. So two tests and ones, that's a free one for you. <laughs> and the results, tweets with emoji on average had nearly 17% fewer impressions in almost 40% lower engagement. <laughs> You'd assume the friendly nature of emojis would get more impressions and engagement, but the data said otherwise. So let's wrap things up. We've been testing various questions and myths and concerns about social media for some time now and have collected some really interesting data and conclusions, but we're far from done. We have multiple experiments in progress right now with big plans for the coming months. For instance, we're going to be taking a close look at how effective video really is on multiple platforms and considering some of the different kinds and styles of video content you might post. So stay tuned for that. Specifically, I mean, right now you can post portrait format video or landscape format video or even square format video on virtually every platform, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, but which one actually performs best per network? We don't want to assume that we know the right answer, so we're gonna test that. Now, some of you may be wondering about other tests and questions you have or myths you'd like to see busted. Well, you're more than welcome to suggest future experiments. You can subscribe to our podcast to hear our latest experiments and results, or tune into our weekly Facebook Live, where we discuss some of the findings from some of our previous tests. I hope you found these experiments and conclusions to be as fascinating and as enlightening as we have. And I see there's some, some questions, so let's jump over there. Hey, Mike, thanks so much. Except I've got to tell you, you just took away my emojis in Twitter. I, know. And sad. I just, I can't, I can't wrap my head around that. I may continue to use them. Um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> data driven, not so much on emojis. Um, I don't know. Yeah, so thanks. Really great stuff. And a lot of these things are questions that we've had at BuzzSumo. Um, yeah. So I appreciate that um, a lot. Uh, we do have some questions. So um, this is from Jenna, and she had a question about myth number two, the third-party posting myth. Yeah. Um, she said, I didn't see any real data supporting busting myth number two. He said it actually had a positive impact, but she's wondering um, how it was positive. Did that mean more comments, more reach, or something else? Do you, do you have that data? Yeah, I don't have the specific numbers in front <laughs> of me, and I can pop those in to an email or a tweet or something like that afterwards. But the idea there is that we were measuring reach and we were comparing the reach of posts that were shared natively on those platforms, well, on Facebook versus the scheduled posts that were done via Buffer, Hootsuite, and Agorapulse. And what we found was that the scheduled posts using a third-party tool actually had higher reach. So that's what we meant by a positive result versus a negative. The, the rumor, the myth, was that if you post using Hootsuite, you're going to reach fewer people. So you shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. well, that's just not true. Okay, cool. That's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, um, we need those tools. We need to schedule that stuff out. Yeah. So um, someone, uh, Scott says, Mike is correct. Reach ended up being higher using apps. And we've tested this twice. Um, I'm guessing Scott is part of Agora Pulse, but Scott, if you're working for another yeah, group, let be, me know. He's Scott, um, <laughs> here. Scott runs all these experiments. I kind of glossed over the names, but yes, yeah, Scott runs all the experiments and ah. Richard do the podcast and Scott appears on our weekly Facebook live with Owen video. So, Hey Scott. Nice. Thanks. Yeah. Now I see your last name. Cool. Um, <laughs> good. Um, all right. Let's see. Uh, Liv is saying I'd be interested to see the difference in results for differing amounts of emojis how many emojis yielded the most engagement okay yeah we can share that i don't know i don't recall if that's in the blog post itself it might be scott might have broken that out but if not we can find that data and share mm -hmm. that with you cool and then um how many hashtags should be used in a post and did you find anything like were there certain uh hashtags that perform better i think is the second part of that Oh, well, there's definitely two very different questions there. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the number of hashtags per post, that's going to depend greatly on each of the different social networks. 
is they're not all the same. So Twitter is just a couple of hashtags, Facebook, maybe just a couple of hashtags, whereas Instagram is quite a few more. And we've gone through and we've been testing that on the various social networks. And what we're going to do very soon is publish kind of an ultimate guide to hashtag use that will pull the data for all those different social networks together so that you can just glance at it and see, oh, okay, these are all the social networks where hashtags work. And these are how many I should use or at least test. And that's something that I actually want to stress right here, which is that all the tests that we're doing are tests and we're testing them on other social profiles, our own ambassadors, influencers, social profiles, and so on. We're not testing them on your social profiles, right? So each of you listening right now, the, the conclusions that we're reaching in the lab, I wouldn't consider that baseline for you. Right. So if we tell you on Instagram, try to use eight hashtags, start with eight hashtags and then experiment a little bit on your own. Add a couple more hashtags, pull back a little bit, vary it up a little bit and see if it makes a difference for you, for your specific audience. But that's yeah. the answer. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I totally agree. I was working on something, not necessarily about social media posts, but about content and saying a similar thing that you take what you see for the digital landscape, you take what you see for your industry, and then test and iterate on it with your own audience. So that's a great point. Yeah, because one of the things that, that has been passed around for years uh, is this idea that there's a best time to post on the social networks. And uh, Stefan Havnanian was kind of famous for saying, every time one of these best time to post infographs is shared, a unicorn dies. I don't know <laughs> if that's true, but they're very famous and people kind of mistakenly swear by them. And I don't mind the idea of trying to determine what a best time is to post. I don't even mind the idea of sharing kind of an aggregate recommended time based on some data. But again, that should only be the baseline. That should be where you start. Uh, in Agora Pulse, for instance, your reports will tell you if you've been posting to Facebook for a while, Agora Pulse will tell you when the best time to post is based on your past data. We'll use that as a baseline, but then experiment beyond that. Try posting at different times on different days, different kinds of content so that you can actually get a sense for yourself what resonates best with your audience. Yeah, I think sometimes those studies also give you a freedom to try something a little bit unconventional. Um, we've done some things about when content um, is posted and found, you know, that if you are posting something late in the day on a Sunday, that's a overall across all of Facebook, a great time for a post. And I think what that does is frees people up to say, um, Hey, I'm going to try a time that's maybe a little bit unconventional or unexpected. So, yeah. um, and, and you have good reason to try it, but also good reason to stop doing it if it doesn't work for you. Right, um, right. it's not your audience. That's the problem if that's not working. Um, so this is from Jenny who asks, uh, besides Hootsuite, what are the best publishing tools to use specifically for Twitter? Oh, well, so part of me obviously wants to say Agora Pulse, right? Because I work I for use Agora, Agora Pulse. Pulse. So yeah. yeah, I get a lot of, I, I've really enjoyed using Agora Pulse for Twitter. So check that one out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and in all fairness, I obviously work for Agora Pulse, but I've been using Agora Pulse since 2016, long before they hired me. Um, I used to use Hootsuite. I literally wrote the book on Hootsuite and then I switched to Agora Pulse and I was much happier. But to be fair, to answer the question of what's best, that's very subjective because in many respects, the tools are all the same, particularly when it comes to Twitter. Just about all the tools can tweet immediately or schedule that out for a future date. Now, if you need to have a queue where you've got set times that you want to publish and you want to be able to add things to that queue to drip that out over time, then Agora Pulse is an option for you. Smarter Queue is an option for you. Media Edgar is an option for you. Uh, you know, Buffer is an option for you. Mm -hmm. Hootsuite isn't because they don't have that. They've got their auto schedule, but that's a little bit different. Um, if you have a team, then you need to ha you know, consider what are the things that you need. Do you want to have saved replies? Do you want to have saved hashtags? Do you need to use a URL shortener? Do you need to use your own branded domain? There's a lot that can go into that specific question. So it's really about what's the best tool for you. 
And that'll take a little bit of time to figure out, but it's well worth it because by taking the time to go through that exercise and looking at objectively, what are your specific needs for each social network, whether it's twi just Twitter or maybe some others, and then what are the options that all of the available tools provide, you might find an option that really is the best for you that, you know, maybe it's one of the top three, maybe it isn't. It's hard to say. And that kind of actually goes back to an earlier question. There was a second part to that hashtag question, which was what are the best hashtags for you to use? And that is totally dependent on you, your audience, your business, the, the nature, the content that you're sharing, you know, the people that you're trying to reach. They're totally different. The hashtags that I use are going to be probably totally different from everybody that's watching this webinar right now because most of the time I'm talking about blogging. And so unless you're doing blogging-related content, you shouldn't be using the hashtags that I'm using. But what you're going to want to do is a mixture of super popular hashtags and super niche hashtags. Instagram is the easiest way to break this out because you you can use more hashtags on Instagram. So it's easier to break this into different buckets. Whereas if you only can use two or three hashtags like on Twitter, that's a little tougher to manage. Uh, but Jen Herman breaks this out really well uh, in some blog content on her Jen's Trends site where she'll tell you, first of all, you do a hashtag search. So you got to do some homework, you got to do some research, and you got to see how often a particular hashtag is being used and that'll tell you how popular it is. And you want to limit your use of the super popular hashtags, hashtags that are getting used like more than a million times on Instagram, only probably a couple of those. And then you want to use some hashtags from a lower tier, like 100,000 to a million. I might not have those numbers exactly right, but you get the idea. Some that are not quite as popular. And then you want to niche down a little bit more and then maybe even have some branded hashtags. I use hashtag blogging brute. I'm as far as I know, the only one using that particular hashtag or very few other people. So if you did that kind of a search, particularly on Instagram, again, you'd find just my content. So when you use that kind of a mix that allows you to quickly jump into and briefly jump into the kind of an explorer search on Instagram that are showing the most popular hashtags like hashtag entrepreneur, right? That is a super, super busy hashtag. If you can get listed there, it's just going to be for a moment and then your post is going to be pushed down. But when you mix that in with those lower tier, those less popular hashtags, you have more staying power. You won't reach as many people initially, but in the long term, you'll continue to reach people with those posts and they're going to be a little more interested in what it is that you have to say. So that actually probably more valuable for you in the long run. Interesting. Mike, um, do you, when you're posting on Twitter with hashtags, so switching from Instagram back to Twitter for a second, do you try and put them in the context of a sentence or do you just tag them on at the end? So f the first part of that is what's your practice and then the second is what uh, do you see different results if you use them in different ways? That is a great question. And that's something that I have personally experimented with. But since it's been a personal experimentation, it doesn't have the formal data and analysis that we've got with the social media lab. So hopefully that's something we can actually, you know, formally test soon. But what I've done in the past is, is both. And where I've kind of fallen today is that I'll use a hashtag in the midst of the tweet if the words are already there or if it's really easy to insert them. Like if I'm talking about blogging and I say blogging in like in the title or the text, you know, I'll just throw the hashtag in front of there. It's easy and it's not too different, right? I'm not, I'm not changing the text too much. Whereas if I'm talking about blogging, but maybe I want this to fall within the overall umbrella of content marketing, I might add content marketing at the end. Mm -hmm. And I might do both depending on, you know, what are the words I might have already hashtagged, how long the overall tweet is, that sort of thing. So it's a little fluid. I get it. And that's, that's probably not the best answer <laughs> when we're trying to you know, give people very firm advice. Um, but that's what I do. Yeah, that's pretty much what I do too. I was just curious about mm -hmm. your thoughts. So here's from Andrew who's asking, could you walk us through a hypothetical experiment designed to find the best channels or keywords to drive user engagement and the context is driving user engagement for a logistics company client um, maybe while you're thinking about that I'll uh, I'll 
kind of jump in a little bit and give you a chance to think. But one thing that, that I do when I have a different topic at BuzzSumo is I'll enter it into our content analyzer and that will show me where content gets the most engagement. So if you have a content piece of what you're doing, um, a tool that will show you where most of the social engagement is taking place could be really useful. Um, and that yeah, seems to cool. work for clients in a lot of different industries. I've tested it recently with manufacturing cleaning or no, um, industrial cleaning, roofing. So you don't have to have a real uh, socially focused um, product to, to benefit from that. Mike, what would you add? Yeah. And I love that you started there because basically what we're establishing again is a baseline mm -hmm. and you can do the same thing. And you can also use BuzzSumo by looking at some of your competitors and plugging in their domain name in the BuzzSumo mm -hmm. and you'll see their best content and where it's getting the most traction socially. So you might find, I would imagine LinkedIn is probably going to be your best platform or your competitor's best platform. And so you'll see that and now you'll know, okay, well, I've got a lot of platforms to choose from. I've got to start somewhere. Let's start with LinkedIn. And what I would do is pull out a trusty spreadsheet and make a list of the posts that I'm going to share with the, the text and the link. And again, this is going to be for LinkedIn. And note when you shared them and do that over the course of a month. Give it a nice, solid 30-day test. And at the end of the month, start a new experiment on another platform with the same content, and meanwhile, go back and note after each one of those posts, how the LinkedIn share performed. And then you do Twitter the next month. And then you do a Facebook page the month after that. And then you do Pinterest if you want, or even Instagram. And at the end of that period, after, you know, and, and maybe you don't want to test them all. Maybe it doesn't make sense for your particular industry. You know, maybe Pinterest is just like, no way, Mike, there's nobody on Pinterest that's going to be searching for logistics pins. Maybe. Maybe not. Know. We won't know until we test. Right? <laughs> so, so, you know, have an open mind, but at some point you will have tested all the platforms that you think are viable for your industry. And then you just go back to the spreadsheet and say, okay, which one won? Which platform did the posts tend to perform better? And you can look at, you can even compare the posts themselves and then on the aggregate. And hopefully that will indicate to you which platform is best. Now, the problem with social media testing is that it's really hard to have a true variable free apples to apples comparison, right? And, and I'll give you an example here. If you have a LinkedIn page and a Twitter profile and a Facebook page, it is highly unlikely that you have the exact same audience, the exact same size, the exact same demographics on all three of those platforms. It's just not likely at all. So there's some caveats that are going to have to be considered when you're setting up these tests. Look at your LinkedIn page. Look at your Twitter account. If your Twitter account has 10 times as many followers as your LinkedIn page, you're going to have to take that into consideration when you're looking at performance. So that's why one of the things that you probably caught on to throughout this presentation was the use of percentages, mm -hmm. right? We talked about engagement rate. We didn't count and compare the number of likes or the number of people that were reached with a particular post. We looked at the rate, the percentage based on the total number, because that is a little bit of a fair comparison. So keep that in mind as you're running this experiment yourselves. Great question. Yeah, that's really, that's really helpful. So um, let's see, I think we, here's one more question about hashtags. Um, we're, we're jumping back and forth. Would you suggest posting hashtags in the caption immediately after whatever else you've written for the caption? Or do you enter, enter, enter so that the captions are, are hidden? What, what do you think? <clears throat> I do like to do a little spacing. I don't, think you need to do a ton of spacing. Uh, I can tell you with, without a doubt, Instagram doesn't care. So there will be no performance change whatsoever. This is purely at 100% an aesthetic decision. So I like white space as a writer. I like lots of white space. So I'll do some emoji and, and some other characters and stuff and create some space there. Do you need to like, you know, dump it down 18 lines? Probably not. Uh, but if it makes you feel better, if you think it looks better that way, by all means do it. 
my preference is that you space down, but that's just as a user. I like yeah, to, yeah. Um, anyway. Um, okay, uh, Scott has weighed in about the Twitter emoji test. Uh, so if you are interested in that, you can see that in the comments. Yeah, and, thanks, Scott. Um, here's one. Mike said that long text outperformed compared to images. We are a software house and I've got posts with text plus image with higher engagement. That's quite surprising to see. I mean, I work what works better for my audience, right? And I think, yeah, we've probably answered that already. Definitely do what works for your audience. Um, <clears throat> and let's see, here we go. I'm just scrolling for other questions. Uh, da, da, da. Do you re did you look at these myths um, across different industries, or were you focused on one industry sector? How I think there are a couple questions here about um, industry segments. So, could you speak a little to the method you used for choosing from industries, if you did any of that? Yeah, and what I'll say on the outset is this is an area where we want to continue to get better. One thing we don't do is publish results based on industry. And I think that's something that we can do in, in, in the coming years is, is do a deep dive on some of these tests in very specific industries. You know, in you know, marketing is easy, but you know, maybe, you know, logistics, not so easy, you know, so we'll need to find some ways to test some of these things in like logistics, in government, in education, and so on. I think those will be really interesting and compelling um, experiments. But as terms of, you know, how they're selected, <clears throat> what we try to do is come up with as broad a basis as reasonable for creating these kinds of tests. And the other thing that we want to do, by the way, is find ways to bring in a little bit more aggregate data based on our users, right? Mm -hmm. We are a social media management tool at Agora Pulse. So we've got aggregate data. We can't go into individual accounts and pull out data, but we can aggregate and say, okay, of all of our Facebook page users, here's what they're experiencing and, you know, come up with questions along those lines. But when it comes to the actual tests, we have to perform them. So there is a limit in terms of like, you know, how many pages we could test to just to create a test. So they'll all be limited in, in to a specific number or relatively low number of pages and profiles and so on. But we try to spread those out as best we can and not have them all, you know, marketers and or all just small businesses. We try to get a, a little bit of a brighter spread. That's great. Thanks. Um, yeah, so let's see, we have one more question. Uh, with myth number one, this was about the negative comments. Mm. Are you recommending leaving the negative comments there and just responding to them from a customer service standpoint or completely deleting or hiding those negative comments? <clears throat> that is a fantastic question because there's almost two different kinds of negative comments, mm -hmm. aren't there? On the one hand, you might have a negative comment that is a legitimate comment. It just happens to be negative, right? Somebody had a poor experience with your brand and they're letting you know about it in the comments. That is definitely not one that you should just outright delete because that's going to cause more problems. It just is. It, that person's not going to appreciate that and they're not going to get, they're not going to go quiet just because mm -hmm. of their comment. So, if you can, and if it makes sense to do so, you could probably and should probably address that publicly in a subsequent comment. And if it requires a more detailed conversation, pull that into a private message because no one wants to read a, a long diatribe and back and forth kind of thing. Create a phone call, do private messages, you know, whatever, whatever that particular user is willing to do to take that private. Once you've shown publicly that you're more than willing to talk with them and try to address their concerns and try to help them out because that will actually favor you more positively and outweigh the negative of the comment itself. But when it comes to comments that, let's just say they're not legitimate comments, they're negative and they're not legitimate concerns by real customers, those you've got a couple options. You can just delete them. And if it's like truly spam behavior, I would delete, report, and block mm -hmm. every single one of those. If it's kind of borderline where we tend to call them trolls, we tend to call people that are putting negative comments to bait you uh, that maybe have nothing to do with the post itself. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting techniques that you might try in that scenario is to hide the comment, which means other people 
can't see it. But the original poster and only their friends can see that they commented on that particular post. So that kind of behavior, we haven't tested significantly, but one person that has is Guy Kawasaki. And he creates very deliberately, very politically polarized content. And he loves all the engagement he gets. He loves all the engagement he gets, positive and negative. And he loves what it does for his particular brand. Now, that's not everybody's cup of tea. But one of the interesting things that he's found is that when he hides the negative trollish type of comments, that actually helps him because the friends see that and the friends comment on that and it leaves that comment there and it increases the reach and the engagement. But it's hidden from everybody else. So it doesn't harm that content. That's great. Wow. Well, Mike, I've learned so much as always from listening to you and I really appreciate the research that the social media lab has done. So keep it coming. Uh, we all need to, to have the facts about what, what works. And uh, I appreciate your emphasis too on just testing things with our own audiences. So thanks so much for your time and everyone. Thank you for joining us today at the BuzzSumo expert webinar. I will send for you a recording of the session. Just give me about 24 hours to get that ready and and have a great day, everyone. Um, thanks for your time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Susan. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.